Would you like to stand to your feet as we pray and prepare ourselves to receive the word of God today? Father, we thank you, God. What a powerful reminder it is to us this morning that you never forsake us, never leave us. To have a God like that and to believe in him brings so much hope to us. And we re recognize this, that the more we confidently hope in you, the more our faith increases in you. So this morning, God, we thank you for reminding us that you are a trustworthy God. Be glorified in our worship today. Thank you for letting us to walk into your presence, to worship, to participate together in this holy communion, reminding ourselves of that great sacrifice on the cross. And to respond back again with gratitude through our giving. What a privilege it is, God, just to be here today. We thank you for today and we pray that as we look to you, continue to look to you, whether we are here at Dream Center or online watching and joining uh, in spirit, whether uh, at home or at workplace or traveling, what does it matter, God? We're all connected together by the Spirit of God. And God, that you would speak to us today. Capture our thoughts today, God. Bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, uh, um, I'd like uh, for us to open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 2. I, I don't know if you realize this. Over the last few weeks, whenever I'm speaking, I'm coming in reverse order in 2 Samuel, um, talking about the life of the King David. And so we come to a place where it's, um, it's, it's that pivotal moment where David, the fugitive, now becomes the David, the king. And so I want to just take a couple of verses there. Well, actually, just one verse and then build uh, what I feel and believe that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today. Second Samuel chapter 2, verses 1. After this, David asked the Lord, should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord replied. Then David asked, which town should I go to? To Hebron, the Lord answered. David um, is at a very crucial juncture in his life. Now, obviously, you saw how chapter 2 begins by saying, after this, right? That means something happened before that, when, uh, at, the, at the place where David is praying. Uh, chapter 1 talks about uh, the circumstances surrounding uh, David at, that, at, the, at this place. That David just heard uh, Saul and Jonathan died. Um, the kingdom of Israel had now been emptied of the king. Saul died in the battlefield. An Amalekite who killed him had walked up to David and actually informed David that uh, um, Saul died. And of course, Jonathan also died. David, did, David is heartbroken. He loved Jonathan. Of course, you know that. He also loved Saul. Even though Saul um, considered David an enemy, David still loved Saul. He respected Saul a lot. We'll talk about how to respect anointing uh, through David's life next time when I get an opportunity to speak. But uh, for now, um, it's really important that... Um, uh, you understand David's condition at this place. He's uh, heartbroken. He, he, uh, normally the process would be uh, uh, the son of Saul would become the king. That would be the process, natural process. Samuel is not there to come and uh, um, you know, re-encourage uh, Israelites uh, and re-anoint David or at least appoint David as the king. David is anointed to be the king um, long ago. 
people know that david would one day eventually become the king nobody knows whether exactly it's the right time to become the king even david himself doesn't know should i take up the mantle should i not you know that's the situation he is in is it a very interesting crossroads uh, it's not like saul does not have any more sons there's another son called um uh, isibosheth who who is also alive so it would naturally if you follow the traditions of the world um uh, naturally he would become the king and in the, indeed he did become the king uh, to benjaminites later on you would see that so david uh, is is trying to decide what should i do with my life and w- what should i do now he is still in um, uh, in uh, uh, you know running uh, he, he was in the state of fugitive and now, now of course he is not any more fugitive because De- uh, saul already died so david is asking god uh, can i go back to juda uh, you know can i go back to one of the towns of juda i am in wilderness right now can i go back to juda and god says yes and then david asks god a very specific question first he asks god can i go back god says yes now david is asking very specifically where should i go and god also answers very specifically to hebron it's um it's an interesting thing because i kind of realized that uh, many of us at some point in a in a, either in the past or today or maybe in the future would uh, have come to a place or will come to a place where we would be at this crossroads these blind intersections where we can't decide which way to go both ways seem to be good three all the three ways seem to be good at the crossroads we 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 would be wondering okay should i go this way this way or this way what should i do right now um human logic says go this or somebody else suggests go that you feel like i want to go forward you kind of figure, you know at a place where you're trying to figure out scratching your head and trying to uh, you know understand how how do i how do i make a decision right now i wish god would tell me what i need to do do i take the job or leave the job do i change my career or not should i accept this marriage proposal or just pass it on and wait for something else or should i should i buy this house or sell this house or 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 you know we 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 all have this moments where we come to crossroads and wonder what does god really want me to do at this point if you are a christian obviously you'd come to that place where you'd question uh, god god what what do you really want me to do um so one of those life size uh, uh, giant questions david is facing should i become the king or should i go to a town and just settle down uh, you know he's talking to god and he's asking god and god does answer him david inquiring of the lord is a common thing in david's life you would see this uh, uh, this pattern in david's life where david go, would go to god and ask god what should i do not just at this juncture very crucial juncture it is but david asked god's will for his life god's guidance in the decisions that he is making almost all through his life you would see if you followed the life of david and the journey that david has been on until this point and from this point to the future he would go to god often and question god asking for specific answers and what i really found fascinating in the life of david is that god specifically answers him i mean really specifically just like just now you saw god just did not say go back to judah he actually said go to hebron logically god should have said go to bethlehem because that's where david comes from but god said go to hebron um it is also an interesting thing in david's life that every time david did not ask god for an opinion but depended on his understanding or depended on somebody else's opinion he always stumbled failed experienced failures in his life every time he went by logic every time he allowed the circumstances to dictate his circums- his decision and every time he allowed somebody else's opinion influence him 
he failed miserably he lived a miserable time you know during that phase of his life but every time he came back and said god would you please speak to me god spoke to him god answered him specifically directing him um david you know made this habit of going to god and asking questions to god specific for specific answers um um just uh, two chapters prior to that you would see in chapter 30 david uh, just came back from a battlefield uh, the same battlefield where um, uh, saul died later on um he was with the philistines he ran away based on his own his, his own wisdom he made a very bad decision david went into philistine land of philistines joined the king of philistines uh, wanted to be there because he thought that would be a safe place for him to be and the king of uh, philistines had given him a town called ziklag and he settled down there along with 600 of his men and their children and their families whatever all that that is is got uh, but david was very uneasy in his heart he he knew he was not in god's will but he lived there in ziklag because it was relatively safe for him when he wanted to join the king of philistine in the war against Phil- uh, israelites the king of philistine looked at him and said listen i don't trust you because uh, in the middle of the battle you may actually turn against me even though you started fighting for me uh, I, because you, obviously they are people they are your own people so i don't want to trust that you would uh, uh, you would fight against them and knowing you with the kind of patriotism you have and the god's you know um, you know love for your god so much that you might actually fight against me i don't want you to be in the battlefield would you go back so david left the battlefield came back to his his town the town that he settled in ziklag only to find that all that he had was already looted all his uh, family members along with all the 600 uh, members his, his 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 troops families children everything was looted by amalekites and was taken away from that they walked into the city of ziklag uh, the town of ziklag which is completely destroyed and bible talks about how everybody's heart was shattered they were filled with so much pain and uh, you know heartache they cried their heart they couldn't cry anymore bible says they cried so much that they couldn't cry anymore and and that anguish had turned into anger against their leader david and uh, people began to decide uh, talk among themselves saying listen we you know we did everything we can for this fellow this fellow has brought us to this place let's t- let's kill him so they started gathering stones in order to kill him david heard about it and bible talks about how david found strength in the presence of god bible simply mentions that david found strength in the presence of how did he find would uh, you would see that in verse 7 chapter 30 verse 7 you would see uh, as you begin to read that uh, that david had asked abiathar one of his followers a priest saying abiathar would you would you get a fourth to me and so abiathar brought that let's 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 go there maybe just read that verse 7 he said to abiathar the priest bring me the a fourth so abiathar brought it then david asked the lord should i chase after this band of raiders will i catch them and the lord told him again a very specific answer yes go after them and then extra instruction also you a promise also you will surely recover everything that was taken from you i like it you would see this this thing of david going to god and asking god for specific instructions and god giving specific instructions and even more promise g- giving extra promises of uh, i mean talking about the future what is going to happen also and you kind of wonder what what, what, what how is it even possible and uh, you, in chapter 30 the reason i asked you to read chapter 30 uh, specifically is because you will find every time david went to god he would ask this priest abiathar who followed him all his life uh, from the time david went to city of nob uh, in the beginning of his career as the, as a commander uh, in chief for um, king saul as he is running away from saul he went to the city of nob to uh, you know uh, trying to hide in the in the in the school of priests abiathar was the head of the school of priests in the city of nob david was there um, um abiathar gave him food then gave him the sword with which he killed goliath and uh, um you know david from there moved on 
um, Saul came to know that David had come to this particular temple and uh, you know, the school of priests and uh, Saul came there, killed all the priests. While he, he was killing all the priests, Abiathar ran away from, that, from there holding ephod in his hand. And that's what he had in his hand. Uh, and somehow joined David later on. And so every time David wanted to pray, he would ask Abiathar, can you bring the ephod? He would put on the ephod and pray and God would speak to him. It looks uh, interesting, obviously. We want to know what this ephod is. In uh, Exodus chapter 28, you would see um, uh, Moses, God speaking to Moses, commanding what kind of clothing that priests should have whenever they want to enter into the presence of God so that they would know what is the will of God for the land of Israel. Um, God was very specific about what kind of uh, 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 color they sh it should be, uh, how it should even be, the laces even should be knitted together and all that. Um, this this, this vest-like thing is called ephod, mm, like our bunion. The only thing is they're just wearing it outside. Uh, um, uh, uh, and studded with different types of stones. Let's not worry about the rest of the explanation. I just want to focus on ephod itself. This would have a set of stones specifically instructed by God. These are the kind of stones I want you to take and put them on the breastplate as the best breastplate. And then of course on the shoulders, he had, he had instructed uh, for different type of stones to be cut and placed there. The size of the stones were also instructed by God. This is how I need it to be designed for um, a priest to wear this. Every time they go into the presence of God so that they may hear my instructions and then bring it back to the people. So there is this connection to God communicating to his people through this ephod. Now we know whether it is David who is inquiring with God or somebody else who is inquiring with God, they would generally wear the ephod. Not everybody would do that. Only priests are allowed to do that. Except that David is probably in the exception in this case. How God would communicate to them, I have no clue. Well, there are multiple theories about how God would communicate through ephod. Some people say that uh, uh, they would ask uh, um, um, you know, questions to God that are more uh, kind of one-answered questions that would lead to one, a single answer like yes or no, yes or no kind of thing and every time they ask a question the stones would illuminate for yes and not illuminate for no, things like that. Uh, some people say maybe um, you know because it was a supernatural time at that period the stones would move in order to form particular Hebrew letters for people to understand, okay, this is what God wants us to do. I don't know what it means, how it answered, but it did answer. At least that part we know. Because apparently every time David put this, this breastplate, uh, this, uh, this ephod, um, God communicated to David. These stones were called Urim and Tumim on the breastplate. How God spoke to him is right now not our problem. What we need to understand is God spoke to him and it has got to do with the ephod. And I'm th at the more I'm thinking about it, the more I wonder, I mean, wouldn't it be easy for all of us to have one ephod, each of us? You know, it doesn't matter how, what, how it works. It is working as long as it works. That's enough for me. And I, I would be, wouldn't it be easier for, for our life would become so easier to know what God wants us to do. Every time they would go, we had a puzzling choice, they would go to God uh, and ask God, what should he do? And with a reverent heart, he would request God and God would answer, will Saul come after me? Yes, he will. Will these, uh, the city of Keilah, would, uh, would they uh, uh, hand me over to Saul? Yes, they would. Should I stay back here or run away from here? Run away from here. Uh, will I be victorious in the battlefield? Yes, you will be victorious in the battlefield. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, God, God did answer every every question very specifically. What I need to uh, need us to understand today is this: that God, the same God who answered every question to David, 
will still answer all our questions even today. We could ask him and he will answer. If we would cry out, he would reply. Uh, we would love to have an effort so that we would know exactly what God wants to do, wants us to do. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have an effort. But again, let me reiterate this. The God who guided David can guide you even today. He does say that in Psalm 32, verses 8, the psalmist, of course, David himself is the psalmist, and he writes like this, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best path for your life. In fact, not only I will guide you in the best path, I will advise you and watch over you. It's a threefold promise. Did you see this? He's saying, I will guide you. I'll tell you what to, go, what to do. And then as you go in that path, I will watch over you and advise you in case if you mess up something in the process. So, uh, the, the same, and he, the, those kind of promises are reiterated all through the scripture multiple times. That God, would telling, uh, God telling us, in fact, in Psalm, Isaiah chapter 30, verses 21, the Bible says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Like the Siri on our phone or uh, uh, whoever that speaks in Google map or whatever. It's, it's like that, that God would actually tell us which way to go, right or to the left. Now you and I wonder, how come I don't hear that same voice telling me which way to go. Let me start off with a very important statement that was made by Jesus. In John chapter 10 verses 27, talking about sheep and shepherd, he introduces himself as a good shepherd and calling all of us his sheep. Then he goes on to say, listen, my sheep recognize my voice. My sheep recognize my voice. I know them and they follow me. So, there's a problem here. If I don't hear the voice of God, it could actually mean I'm not a sheep. That's a problem. So if there is anybody who walked into this service today saying, I don't know, I can't hear God's voice. There's a problem there, right? Right? I wonder how come we don't hear the voice of God. I'll give you at least two reasons and again give you sub reasons out of that. Why we don't hear the voice of God. Because either we are paying attention to the wrong voice or we have a wrong heart. Either we are paying our attention to the wrong voice. Some of us maybe have paid our attention to wrong voices. There are multiple voices in this world that keep coming at us which drown the voice of God if you keep ignoring the voice of God and keep paying attention to other voices. Many of us pay attention, too much attention to the opinions of others, the criticisms of others. Their voices dominate our life. Their suggestions, their advices, their opinions, their expectations those voices drown the voice of God, the commands of God, the will of God in our lives. We become deaf to the voice of God and become more open to others' voices because we're trying to somehow please everybody else. Could it be possible that some of us this morning are struggling to hear the voice of God because you're paying attention to people's voices? That could be one reason. You could be paying attention to people's opinions listening to their expectations. Or maybe some of us are unable to hear the voice of God because we are paying attention to the voice of the culture to compromise our standards. Everybody else is doing that. Sometimes some voices don't have to be audible to us. They can be inaudible and still be audible to us. Like. Uh, the voice of the culture is a voice that does not necessarily shout at us, but does shout at us. 
that we see too many people doing too uh, you know the same thing and you wonder maybe i should also do the same thing if i have to get good results so you compromise on your values you compromise on your faith you kind of negotiate your faith with god saying listen god the, up to this point it's fine not not really this part of my life i mean if i do that i would lose a lot maybe that's what we think voice of conformity or maybe it's the voice of condemnation the voice of satan that um, satan constantly is reminding you of your past of the mistakes that you made of the kind of failure you have experienced in life of how you broke everybody's heart how you are not a trustworthy person how you are not a person of credibility he would constantly remind you with his voice of condemnation how you broke the heart of god how you broke the heart of those who trusted in you how you lost everything and he would constantly remind you of your failures you let the voice of god drown in the voice of accuser so you are unable to hear the voice of god so it could be possible that some of us have developed deafness to the voice of god and are paying attention to wrong voice or maybe that's not the case some of us just simply have a wrong heart you know i i'm i'm i i i i didn't want to sound like a reductionist when i said simply wrong heart a wrong heart is a really bad thing that our heart has now become so calloused that the voice of god is not able to penetrate through into our hearts there were times even god wondered at israelites and thought these guys they're never going to pay attention to me in isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 listen the lord's arm is not too weak to save you nor is his ear too deaf to hear you out hear your call it's your sins that cut you off from the lord because of your sins he has turned away and will not listen to you anymore it sounds like he will not listen to you anymore actually what isaiah is trying to say is you are not listening to what he is saying you constantly ignore what god is speaking into your life week after week if not uh, every day at least for some of us week after week this is a bad thing anyway when i say week after week that god is constantly speaking to you and yet you ignore it consistently ignore it that you either deceive yourself to a place where you're thinking i'm good i'm good enough are you deceive yourself to justify your actions and your attitude and your lifestyle it's called self deception a callous conscience paul calls it a conscience that is seared you are not able to be sensitive to the voice of god anymore a hardened heart god calls it a stone heart in jeremiah chapter 5 verses 3 lord you are searching for honesty you struck your people but they paid no attention you crushed them but they refused to be corrected they were determined with their faces like a stone they have this heart that refused to repent look at the description for some of us that's a de- description we make our faces like stone faced no matter what you say nothing goes whatever you say you yell at me i won't care kind of that's that's what god is saying through isa <coughs> uh, jeremiah that you have developed a stone heart in you. you you nothing moves you anymore nothing moves you nothing you are not sensitive to voice of god neither to the presence of god god cannot speak to someone whose heart is insensitive who is constantly ignoring the promptings of god of the conscience by the holy spirit why would we become like that stubborn rebellious callous 
we become like that because we have an unyielding heart an unyielding heart which simply means we have developed this heart that keeps saying i really don't want to believe everything god says i mean obviously all of us don't hear the voice of god as such we hear people talking to you saying this is the voice of god people like me standing here and bringing the word so you you uh, we generally sit there and as we are receptors we are saying i don't want to believe this fellow i you're missing the point you because you don't trust the messenger you don't trust the message itself many of us fall into this trap of rejecting the message of god because of the messenger You see, God is an expert in using anybody. He can use a donkey to speak. Just because it's a donkey speaking, you many of us refuse because it's a donkey speaking. What you and I are missing is a donkey is actually speaking. That's the point you and I need to recognize. If the donkey is speaking, which means God is speaking. Um. we feel that we we don't want to believe this thing is not trustworthy or this thing is not up to up to my liking it's an unyielding heart that says i don't want to believe i i i, I don't trust god now you don't trust the voice of god either because you don't trust the one who is bringing the voice of god or because you have bad experiences with god well at least in trust before you did trust god you did follow certain things and you saw bad results and you felt god is not trustworthy i mean he is trustworthy for some part not not really everything uh, an unbelieving heart turns you away from god and shuts you off from his promises take care my brothers right a writer of hebrews says in hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 take care my brothers and sisters that there not be in any one of you a wicked and unbelieving heart which refuses to trust and rely on god that it turns away from the living word of god so an unyielding heart because you stopped believing god because of what happened in the past or because of what is happening around you you think i don't know if i can believe everything god says because it didn't work for me it doesn't work at all so an unyielding heart obviously then leads to a stoned heart a heart that closes off completely why do we come to an unyielding heart we move to a place where our hearts become unyielding when we don't grow spiritually a spiritual life that's not growing an undeveloped spirit a spiritual life that is not constantly growing will develop a unyielding heart an unyielding heart will lead to a callous conscience you see the connection now if you and i as as a believer don't make conscious efforts to stay in connection with the holy spirit by reading of the scripture and paying attention to the voice of god regularly we will we will not grow undeveloped right there is no development in our spiritual life when you don't have spiritual development then you will start this uh, you you'll start developing unbelief towards the word of god when you start developing unbelieving unbelief towards the word of god you then obviously stop trusting god completely an undeveloped spirit paul uh, writing to the church in corinth Uh, in his second letter to the church in Corinth, says this: that listen, once you had a veil that kept you from seeing the light, but when you came to Christ, that veil is being removed so that you can see what God wants you to see. But some of you still have that veil. He says he's talking to the church. Huh? He's not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the church members. 
saying, listen, some of you still have the veil because, you're un- because of that veil, you're unable to see God, which simply means you're not growing consciously. You're not making any effort to grow spiritually. And that's why a lot of us are unable to hear the voice of God. We are losing our ability to hear the voice of God. Or lost the ability to hear the voice of God. Even though God still guides us, God still wants to speak to us. God, uh, God has always been a God who wants to direct our paths. We are unable to recognize His voice. We do wish that we make good choices, but many of us are making bad decisions because we lost the ability to hear the voice of God. So how do we receive the voice of God? How do we receive the instruction from God? Now what I'm about to say is a bottom line, basic, foundational thing for every Christian to know. But let's just remind ourselves. Number one, you have a Bible. Read it. Because that's the primary language of God. It's the language with which God speaks to us. Everything else is a secondary language. This is the primary language of God speaking to us. That's why God made sure you got the language of God in the language that you can understand. Any language you are speaking, he's making sure the word of God reaches out to you with that language. So that any one of us who are facing life's important questions can go to the word of God and find answers for it. Some of us are, are uh, you know, have this logic that, well, this is a 5,000 year old book or 2,000 year old book. How can, how can it speak to a 21st century Are we still in 21st century? 21st century, I'm just, sometimes I'm confused. I moved from 20th century to 21st century, so I'm still confused sometimes. So uh, we are in 21st century. How how, how come that that is written so so long ago can speak to us? Now here here is the truth, listen. Whether we live in 21st century, or whether we lived in uh, uh, 1st century AD, or 5,000 years ago prior to that, BC, we are the same. Our nature is the same. We behave the same. Just that we are using technology to behave a little more weirdly, but we behave the same. We have the same line of thinking, same behavior patterns, Same struggles with sin. No change in that. Remember that. Every one of us from 5,000 years ago to till till today or whenever the beginning of creation is, from then till today, every one of us go through exactly the same struggles. When it comes to relationships, we have the same problems. When it comes to money, we have the same problems. When it comes to jobs and integrity, we have the same problems. When, we have, when it comes to our credibility, we have the same problem. The, the nature never got changed. It's the same nature. Same behavior. Same uh, style of speaking. Just that our language might have become a little more refined, but it's just the same. So if our behavior and our lifestyle, uh, our uh, uh, you know, li- living style and our, our, our thinking style uh, our character, if, it's, if that's the same, then the word of God should also be the same. If it brought transformation 5,000 years ago, it can still bring transformation even today. If it was living 5,000 years ago, it is still living today. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12. The author of Hebrews tells us, for this word of God is living and active. This word of God, the word of God is living and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. What he is saying is that there is no place in your life that the word of God cannot penetrate into. It can divide anything. 
It judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Living and active. That's the, those are the words we need to remember. The word of God has life. Those nouns that you see in the scripture have pulse. They, these verbs darting back and forth like blood vessels running through our, our blood uh, and you know, keeping us alive. If any one of us, if we pay attention, we know that in our loneliest hours, God spoke to us and said, I'd never leave you nor forsake you. In our times of anxiety, God spoke to us, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your petitions to God. In times of confusion, you hear the voice of God telling you, not this way, but this way. Whether through a direct command or through an uh, indirect uh, 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 statements or uh, through the stories of people, heroes of faith, God continues to speak to us even today. Correcting us, nudging us, teaching us that you know, we live our lives for one audience, the audience of one. No wonder Paul says this to us in Colossians chapter 3 verses 16. Let the words of Christ in all its richness live in our hearts and make you wise, he says. Use his words to teach and counsel each other. Powerful statement it is. So word of God, he speaks to us through the word of God. Number two, he speaks to us, a family of God. The family of faith. If you have a family of faith, consult them. Many of us are blessed with parents who know Christ, who love Christ, and who follow Him. Some of us may not have that privilege. I understand that. But many of us, if we don't have physical parents who are not in faith, at least we have spiritual parents who are in faith. Who led us to Christ. These are the people who love us, who wish best for us, who pray for us, who always want to make sure that our life is in the right path. And right path. So don't make a decision whether large or small without sitting before God first with an open heart and open Bible and most importantly open ears. But it's also important that we pay attention to people of God in our lives. People of faith in our lives. Men and women of God in our lives. Now, not every man and woman of God can give you an answer for your life. Not every, I'm not saying they are not men and women of God. I'm just simply saying they don't know you. Some of us call up people who we have never met and ask them for a prophetic word, they, whatever they say, really. But go to people who love you, who know you personally, your struggles, who pray for you, who actually wish that you grow in life. That they honestly want to make sure that you stay in the right path. Obviously, our parents would be the best option first, who are godly parents. And then people who we know are, are, are always constantly guiding us and, and ha nudging us in the right direction. Go to them. They will speak to you out of their experience. They will speak to you out of the wisdom that they received from the Lord. Some of us, uh, uh, you know, when we struggle on understanding the scripture much more clearly, we go to people who have a better understanding of the scripture and we ask them, can you just... Help me to understand this. And God, because God gave them the wisdom, they'd be able to explain the scripture much better than what we can understand on ourselves. Hebrews again in chapter, uh, chapter 13, verses 7. Um, look, look at what he says. The author of Hebrews. Hebrews. 
Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Meaning, the people who taught you the word of God the first would become naturally your leaders. If you have godly parents, they'll be the ones who would first taught you, right? They are the leaders in your life. If you don't have parents who taught you the word, but others who brought the word of God to you, they would naturally be your leaders, spiritual leaders. So what he's saying is, listen, remember what they taught you. Remember all the things that they taught you from the beginning. They taught you because they want to make sure you grow, you learn, you become better. But then he didn't stop there. Look at what he says. Think of all the good that has come out of their lives. Consider the outcome of their life. That's what he's saying. Remember the good that they taught you. Remember the word that they taught you. Consider the good that came out of them. Consider the outcome of their lives. Look at the fruit that they bore in their lives. Consider it. Then he goes on to say, imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. I like the way very specifically the author of Hebrews instructs there to us. You know, gives, gives us this instruction. Look at what he's saying. He's saying when you look at leaders, remember the word of God that they have taught you. Not their words, but the word of God that they taught you. That's number one. Number two, he says, consider the outcome of their life. Look at the fruit that they bore. But don't follow that fruit. You are supposed to imitate their faith. Many of us mess up here. We all want to become Billy Grants. We all want to become, um, um, uh, you know, I don't know, who else? <laughs> I can quote names. We are on live right now, obviously. I Billy Graham is the best option for me. So, we all want to become somebody. Unfortunately, we all want to become them because we see the outcome of their life. What he's saying is don't go for the outcome of their life. Don't follow that. Follow their faith. The outcome of their life is because of their faith. It's that faith you and I need to learn to imitate from our leaders. Not the outcomes. Each, for each one of us, our success, our outcomes are very different. What we need to consider is the outcome. How their faith helped them to achieve what they did. So therefore, let me have that faith. And I do what God wants me to do. There are people in our lives who are like that, who taught us, who lived that word, who, who brought fruit out of that. May we learn from them. Choose to go to them. Make decisions. Every time we make decisions, we go to them and sit with them and ask them. Now, they may not agree with what you are making, the decision. Here is the difference between godly leaders and controlling leaders. Listen to this. However spiritual they may look. When a godly person counsels you, and you say, listen, the reason I, I may not be able to agree with you, I'm making this decision because this is what I feel. This is what God spoke to me through the word of God. These are my circumstances. This is the reason why I came to this, this, this particular decision. When you give that, an that as an explanation to them, they will look at you and they'll say, all right, I may not agree with you, but I'll be, I'll be okay with that. Go ahead and do it. Because you, they understand the importance of listening to God first, not them. You, you, you see the difference now? A godly leader will understand, you need to listen to God first. I only confirm what God is speaking to you. Now, I may have a different opinion. But if God spoke to you, I'm okay with that. Even if you do this and you fail, I'm still going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. And if you are successful, I'll change my opinion. That's the kind of leaders we need to have in our lives. Develop people. Uh, try to put yourself around them. They may not agree with us. But if you are convinced that God spoke to you, they'll agree with you. And they'll say, all right, I'll go with you. As long as what decision you're making, whatever decision you're making, is not in contradiction to the word of God, they'll be happy to be with you. 
Am I making sense to you right now? Yeah. Those are the people we need to have in our lives. Go to them. It's a family of faith and we need to surround ourselves with them. They will give you wisdom. They will protect you, save you from the battles. And even if you fail, they'll come and help you, rescue you, make you stand up again. Now here is something that I want you to know. Now most often God speaks to us on the reverse case. If you are the person to whom people are get, coming to get counsel. Most often God speaks through you and you don't even know that God is speaking through you. About somebody's specific problem. It's until they come to you and they say, listen, what you said is exactly what I'm going through. You would not realize God is speaking through you. Most often. Number two, if God does give a special revelation about somebody to you, you don't talk about it in public. Nobody who talks about somebody else's fault in public, you should never follow that person. Never follow that person. That's not even biblical at all. Bible talks about going to, your per going to the person in secret, meeting individually and correcting that person. Helping that person to become better. Never publicly shame them. So they, there you go. Those are the people, look for, look for them, put, them, put our, yourself around them and they'll keep investing into your life with the word of God. Uh, and number three, um, if you have a heart for God, listen to your heart. A lot of times, as you grow in the Lord, you will begin to realize the Spirit of God simply nudges your life, nudges your heart. Christ nudges a Christ-possessed heart. God is working in you, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 verses 13. God is working in you, how? To help you want to do and be able to do what pleases Him. I mean, the more I think about that verse, the more I realize how God works in our lives. If you have a heart to obey God, He would create a desire inside you to obey God. And then give you the ability to obey God as he reveals his will to you. I love it. That's what he's saying. If you don't know the will of God, but you want to know the will of God, with a heart that says, I want to obey the will of God, then he will create a want inside you, a desire, and the ability to obey his will. That's the kind of heart we need to have. A heart that is willing to listen to the nudges of the Holy Spirit. Many times God speaks to us as he nudges us. Now, some of us can have those impressions and think that that is God speaking. How do we know that it is not God, it is, whether it is God speaking or not? It's because it doesn't contradict the word of God. In, how do you come to that place? I want to give you two examples, okay? Luke chapter 1. Luke is writing this, let, this, this wonderful gospel and he's writing to his friend, right? Who, who he calls Theophilus. And he says, listen, Theophilus, many have already, re, you know, re, let's, maybe let's just go there. Luke chapter 1. I don't want to mince the words of Luke. Many have set out to write the accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. What he's talking about is the gospel of Jesus. He's talking about the history of Jesus. Okay? Now, look at what he's saying. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus. Wait a second. On one side he's saying, a lot of people already wrote the gospel. That's what he's saying. 
and among them there are many eyewitnesses who wrote the gospel and still i decided to write another gospel it's he who is deciding to write the gospel look at that he decides to write another gospel even though in the in there are there's a whole number of gospels already out there in circulation he felt that it would be much more better if i can take all those accounts and put them in an order and recount the story of christ from the beginning to the end i thought it would be nice who put that thought in his head that's called spirit of god nudging him there's no explicit direction it's just an idea a thought a, a, a nudge in his heart an impression in his heart he felt this is a good thing to do let me do this another guy another example jude the book of jude chapter uh, oh, there's only one chapter of course uh, jude verses 2 uh, this is what jude is saying listen my friends i very much wanted to write you about the salvation we all share what he's saying is i really wanted to write a good good book on salvation but i felt look at what he's saying i felt the need to write you about something else personally i want to write about salvation but in my heart i felt maybe i should write something else personally if you give me a choice i would do this but in my heart i felt i need to do something else you see what i'm trying to say now those are nudges of the holy spirit directing you to do something else those nudges you would understand some of us who are married we understand the nudges right when our wife just pokes it lightly you understand you need to lessen your talk a little more harshly you need you know you need to shut your mouth you kind of figure figure that out and it it goes in a different direction you know you need to change the direction of your talk all that sometimes it doesn't have to be a hand it can just be a word a monosyllable word and you will read an entire paragraph in that and you kind of know what exactly is being conveyed to you sometimes it doesn't even have to be a word it could just be and you know you can actually read a book out of that you kind of figure out right what exactly is being conveyed to you husbands how do you come to that place you live with that person you lived with that person long enough journeyed with that person long enough you understand their moods you understand their behavior you understand how, what they mean by standing in one particular manner and standing in a different particular different manner you know exactly what their postures mean you know what their face means you know what their syllables mean how do you come to that place a relationship right a relationship holy spirit brings you to that place as you grow in relationship with him you come to a place where you don't have to fast for 40 days to know his will you just know with a nudge in his heart nudge in your heart which is not this is what god wants me to do and you know it's not contradictory to the word of god So when you come to that place and some of us are like listen i got dreams and i got these impressions how do i know i just for the just to make sure that you never mess up i'll give you four filters and then we'll close four filters that you put everything through number one, is it in line with the word of god very simple is it in line with the word of god everything that i do everything that i'm thinking everything that i'm concluding come to conclusion or, or, or my decision is it in line with what the word of god says because here is the point god never contradicts his word god never gives you an instruction that is in direct contradiction to his word he never tells you to cheat against your wife he never tells you to compromise your integrity in your workplace he never tells you to do that he doesn't do that he cannot go against his own word so he will never give you an instruction that is in direct contradiction to his word 
He will never tell you to violate anything that he revealed as the right thing in his word. He will never tell you to ignore the word of God and do something else. Because you feel some godly person has spoken to you or some scripture that some word, some wonderful looking scripture looking like statement on the Facebook page. You know, there are a lot of scripture looking like quotations on the Facebook page. Everything that is quoted on the Facebook or your Insta are not from the word of God, huh? by the way. So don't follow everything that you listen to or talk to if it is in contradiction to the revealed word of God. Simple. God never will reveal you anything other than this. Anything that contradicts this word. Uh, he will never tell you to disobey what he already told you. To obey. Because he is not like man, like a shifting shadow. He will not tell you one thing at one time, another thing at another time. He is consistent in your paths. It, is it in contradiction to the scripture? That's the point first. Or does it line up with the scripture? Sorry. Does it line up with the scripture? The opposite would be, if I'm making a decision, is it in contradiction to the word of God? The second, second filter would be, is it going to make me more like Christ? In, let me simplify even that. It simply means, is it going to make me a better person as a Christian? Is my character becoming better? Is my faith growing more? Am I growing in my understanding of God a little more deeper? Ultimately, is Christ going to be glorified through me or not? That's the whole point there. The, the goal of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to make us more like Christ. So that means anything God asks us to do, He would ask us to do which will bring glory to His name. It will never be about self-promotion. It will never be about self-preservation. It will never be about self-serving. Um, um, you know, um, it will always be about the kingdom of God. It will always be about the glory of Christ. The faith steps that you take, the decisions that you make, even though in the present it may look it is benefiting to you, it will always end up resulting, benefiting the kingdom of God. Even though it may seem like it is not beneficial to you, it will always end up becoming beneficial to the kingdom of God, bring glory to God. So either it benefits you or does not benefit you, the decision that is given to you by God or the direction that God puts you on will always bring glory to God at the end, which means you become better. You grew in your faith. You understood how God functions in this world. But the wisdom that comes from above, James says in James chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, it is from, uh, the, the one that comes from heaven, first of all, is pure. It's peace-loving. It's considerate. It's submissive. It's full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. It produces a harvest of righteousness. If you get an idea on how to promote yourself, then it's not from God. Simple. If you get an idea that makes you feel like, how can I achieve instant fame, instant wealth, instant comfort? I'm sorry to say it's not from God. God doesn't give you ideas of self-promotion or self-serving, of self -am selfish ambition. We need to think like Jesus, act like Jesus, value the thing he values, love the people he loves, um, you know, walk in faith. Now, let me pause there because it's very important for me to make a very important distinction. I know I, I crossed my time, but I still want to... Um, Sometimes God is very specific as he is with David. Very specific. Like he'll say, go to Judah, go to Hebron. But sometimes God will tell you only the next step. Will not give you the ultimate goal. He'll simply say next step. Like he spoke to Abraham and said, listen, just sell everything you got, take the next step. Yeah, but, but my life is great, God, here. I know. You could use me here, I know. 
but I got another plan. Can you tell me the other plan? No. First, you need to believe that I got a plan. Okay, how do I believe that you got a plan? Sell everything you got. Get out. Take this step. You take this step, then the next step becomes more clear. You understand? But this step, these steps that you're taking, right? How do you know? When God speaks to you, here is the third. Third confirmation. You'll have this peace in your heart. That you know this is what God is asking me to do. Now in this case, you have clarity. So therefore, you'll not be afraid. You have clarity, right? You know you, know you need to go to Judah. And then you need to go to Hebron. You know, you already know exactly the angle that God is sending you on. So you're like very confident. You'll walk in that. Many of us want this. But more than this, we will develop more like Christ if we have this. When God gives you one step at a time and you still choose to believe in him and take risks for him, take that step. You'll begin to see how God begins to unfold greater things in your life. That one step of faith is necessary for us. Now, that step of faith will only be taken in deep, deep in your heart. You're at peace. You, you have questions. I'm not saying not questions. You, you, you obviously, you, you're always going to have questions. You're always going to have this, like, I wish I know more. Uh, you, you, you are always going to be afraid. You, you are going to be afraid. Being afraid is a good thing, you know. You're going to be afraid, of course. But you take that step. We need to learn to do it afraid. You see, getting out of the boat is a scary thing. I'm definitely sure he got out of the boat with fear. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to not to have clarity. What's more important is that you know God is speaking to you. That you know this is the, this is the voice of God and I'd follow it. And that step of faith is what makes a miracle possible. It's just you got to get out of the boat to stand on the water. It's just you got to sell all that you got and get out of Ur so that you can go to the promised land. But for that, you need to be at peace in your heart. The peace that God gives you surpasses all understanding. Did you see that? It doesn't say the peace that God gives you gives you all understanding. It doesn't say that. He says it surpasses all understanding. Meaning you will still not have full understanding. You still have no clarity. But you know, this is what God wants me to do. And then of course, if you have a godly counsel in your life, they will agree with it. They may disagree in the sense of a uh, uh, you know, complete picture. Sometimes people who love us want everything to be clear. They want every step to be defined. Not because they want to discourage us, but just because they love us. But they understand that's how God moves. And they will also stand with you and say, Let's just, just, let's do it. Even if you fail, what does it matter? We'll be there. Uh, those are the godly people. Uh, th th that's the kind of agreement I'm talking about. When godly people, uh, when I say godly people agree with you. They will stand with you, counsel you, um, help you, advise you, uh, maybe uh, discipline you, but they will always be there with you. Does godly counsel agree with you? You see, if God spoke to you, and if you have a godly counsel, God will also speak to them. If not, at least God will tell them, keep your mouth shut, follow him. At least one of those two. And because they're godly people, they will listen to God. Does it make sense to you now? 
I, I, so you, you kind of begin to see this filter. You put yourself into, put everything that you do in that filter. Every time you will have victory in your life. Successful. You will be successful in everything that you do. May God help us as we make decisions in our lives. If you are in that place, at that intersection, a blind intersection, and are not sure what would be the right place, right way to go to, what would be the right step to take, it's okay. If God tells you to take that step, take it. And you know for sure it does not contradict the word of God. And the people you love and believe in are saying, it's fine, let's, 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 let, let's take this step, take it. If you feel that it's not, you're not at peace in your heart, feel like the godly counsel that you have in your life is completely resistant to the idea. Maybe you got to give another thought and think about it again. And um, for some of us, we require obedience. Obedience two ways. Obedience to do what God is asking you to do. Obedience not to do what God is saying not to do. Both ways we still need obedience in life. And we will see victory. Uh, you see, the reason God spoke to David always is because David has this heart that is very settled. It believed that every time I ask God, God will speak to me. That's number one. Every time. He believed, he went to God with such confidence that I, if I ask God, God will answer me. Believed. When God says whatever he wants to say, I will do it. He made a decision that whatever God tells me, I'll do it. He believed and he decided in his heart that I'm going to do this. So God spoke to him. If you believe and decide, whatever God tells me I'll do, he will speak to you. No doubt. Don't doubt it. Let's close our eyes. Whatever decision place you are in, submit it to God. I do hope God answered many of your questions. If, he did, if, if, you, if you still have questions, he will still answer you. Listen, my friend. I'm, I'm uh, you know, with, with, with my human limitations, time and my own vocabulary, I could, I could teach you so much only. But the Holy Spirit has got you. I mean, he's with you always. The beautiful thing about him is he will teach you. Bible says he will teach you. And so listen to him. Ask him to give you more clarity. He will give you. And guide you. If there, is, there are people here who are at that place, at this juncture, an intersection, a crossroad, and you're wondering which way to go. And you felt this morning God spoke to you and you know that you need wisdom, you need guidance. It's, you know, just like me, and I, I'm asking you, if, if you're here, that, if you are that person, I'd like to pray along with you. Would you stand to your feet? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. As you're taking this time to stand and ask God for wisdom, our worship team would sing. Thank you, Jesus.
Father, I stand along with those who are acknowledging their need for your counsel. At these crossroads, God, many times we are confused. We wonder exactly which way is your will. Because uh, those ways that we have in front of us all seem to be right ones. If it's just black and white, it would be easier for us. Sometimes we stand in places that are more grayer. And we wonder what exactly you want us to do. But your word teaches us that you never mince your words. So whatever instruction it is, God, that you want to give us, not only we ask you, but we are willing to obey it. It may seem to contradiction, contradictory to what we always thought would be the right solution. But if it is you who is speaking to us, God, and if we have that assurance in our heart, we will obey you, God. We decide to obey you. I have decided to follow you, God. And it, 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 you know, it may seem like this step may lead to a little bit of uncertainty, unsurety, uh, um, uh, in a, a future. But what does it matter, God? The future is in your hand. Tomorrow is in your hand. And today, you ask me to take this step, I will take this step. Anyone who is coming to you with that reverent heart, with that obedient heart, would you speak to them? Instruct them in the way they need to go. Thank you for speaking to us today. As we go back from here, God, may your spirit continue to minister to us through your word. As we grow in our relationship with you, you would begin to give those impressions in our hearts, not just in those directions that we need to take, go to. Thank you for today. And everyone who listened to your voice and is willing to receive your voice, may they experience what you can do in their lives. Only you can do that. Bless you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And would you all stand to your feet as we close the service with the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the love of our Father and the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.